it might be nice if from the white Western lens, we begin to look at theology through other people's eyes. As African-American man, as an African-American man, I look at the text and I see God's call for justice. I see God's call for uh, the appropriate treatment of our sisters and brothers in this world. I see God's call for a transformation of this larger society on just about every page of the Bible. Hello, welcome to Great Bible Teacher Interviews. I'm Rick Jordan, and each week I take the opportunity to interview a scholar, an author, or a practitioner in the areas of Bible or biblical interpretation or spiritual formation. Today, it's my joy and honor to interview Rodney Sadler. Dr. Sadler is the Associate Professor of the Bible at Union Presbyterian Seminary in Charlotte, North Carolina. He is also the director of the Center for Social Justice and Reconciliation. He received his BA and MDiv from Howard University and his PhD from Duke University. He's the author of the book, Can a Cushite Change His Skin? And he's a contributing writer to the book, True to Our Native Land. He had an article in that book about Africa and the relationship of Africa to Christianity. And so that was intriguing to me. That was a, where our conversation began. So now, welcome Rodney Sadler. Who's been a great Bible teacher in your life? That's the name of our ministry is Great Bible Teachers. And I always like to hear about who has shaped the people who are now shaping us. So who, who are people that shaped you? Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Thank you for having me here today. Thank you for allowing me to, to talk on this series. Uh, glad to be able to do so. Uh, when I think about great Bible teachers, te people who influenced me, uh, the first one has to be my grandfather, uh, Arthur, Deacon Arthur Powell. He was an incredible human being who shaped the lives of so many people. And from a very quiet way, he worked for the gas company. He worked as a limousine driver, uh, owned a small limousine business later in his life. He was a very common, very ordinary man, but he spent his time, whenever he had free time, trying to teach young people about scripture. He opened a vacation Bible school in his basement. Uh, so we had a basement vacation Bible school. And uh, one of the students, I, I remember, he had a number of students that I, I uh, people of my mother and, and aunt's age that uh, I grew up uh, idealizing that he taught. But one of the people that he taught, I didn't know he taught, uh, my father's youngest brother, uh, who lived a few doors down the, the road, used to come over for those classes. And uh, years later, I was talking to him one day. I was uh, preaching his anniversary service as a pastor of the church. And he, he stood up, he said, I, one of the people I most need to thank for shaping me in my love of scripture was Deacon Arthur Powell. So my father's baby brother, mentioned my mother's father as the great biblical instructor for him. I would be remiss not to mention the name of Cain Hope Felder, uh, the groundbreaking author of Troubling Biblical Waters, who uh, almost single-handedly started the movement for African-American biblical hermeneutics with that text in 1989. Uh, the editor of Stony the Road We Trod, which was a collection of those early uh, contemporary scholars, who were really breaking the ground on African-American biblical hermeneutics and showing that it was not just one thing, but that it could move in different trajectories, but still be authentic to the African-American community. Uh, people like Randy Bailey, um, uh, Bishop Tom Hoyt, uh, Clarice Martin, uh, Renita Weems, really come to the fore through uh, that book. And in part because of the work that Kane Hope Felder did as a groundbreaking biblical scholar. I believe he's even involved in this book, True to Our Native Land, as one of the, uh, the major editors of that text as well. Uh, so he recently passed away, and uh, I still want to honor his name and his legacy as a great biblical teacher. And finally, one, one great biblical teacher that did not teach me directly, but has continued to teach me over the years is Walter Brueggemann. I find him to be uh, wholly inspiring, uh, his uh, work is groundbreaking, and I love the way he expands in a very interdisciplinary way, the way that we engage scripture, and helps us to, to sort of think about the larger issue that's involved. What is religion really? What are we doing by creating an alternative reality? What are we doing by pressing the imagination of people in a new way so that new life is possible? 
So I've been a great fan of Walter Brueggemann over the years as well. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you for sharing some of your story. Uh, and you are a scholar yourself, uh, and you are a writer as well. And you mentioned the uh, the book True to Our Native Land, which uh, is uh, somewhere right up in there <laughs> on my bookshelf. Uh, and um, in that volume, you have a chapter on Africa and Africans. And um, I, I just thought we could talk about that a little bit, about what, uh, why, ha why, I guess, has there been a lack of understanding about the importance of Africa and Africans mm -hmm. in Bible interpretation? And, um, and what do you see as uh, some ramifications if we don't pay attention to that? Yes. Thank you for that question. It's a, a wonderful question to ask, particularly at this particular point in time in our history, as we begin to struggle with the issues of racial disparity in America, as we begin to wrestle with the way that our history has unfolded in a way that has racialized our lives. I think that the uh, disappearance of Africa uh, from the biblical text has been uh, both intentional and thoroughly harmful uh, for people. If you look at the vast majority of scripture, it's written in and about places in Africa. The, the nation that we call Israel, uh, that sits on one side of the Jordan River, sits on the African continental plate. Uh, it is uh, part of the African continent. And uh, to not think about that, to not imagine that this is uh, what it is, uh, is to divorce it from its, its not just its, uh, its extant reality, but to divorce it in our mind from the biblical narrative. The land of Jordan sits on the other side of this other continental plate, the Arabo-Nubian continental plate. The Arabo-Nubian continental plate is one of the two major plates that make up the African continent. If you follow the, the Jordan Valley all the way down, it goes through the Red Sea, and it continues down into Africa. We call it the Great Rift Valley down there. The Jordan Valley is just the northern portion of the Great Rift Valley. And if we can begin to recognize that, we set the Bible in a larger context. Now, I'm not trying to say that uh, the Bible is only about black people, or uh, that's not the argument I'm trying to make. What I'm trying to say is that Africa is a large and diverse place uh, that has contributed much to the larger world, and that we do a disservice by not imagining that scripture, the Bible, and the biblical story of Christianity evolves in this context. What, what does it do to us? Well, uh, in part, I think there's a uh, there's a rift in the Western the psyche, uh, a schism in the Western psyche that has f helped to find a way to deal with the fact that we think about Africa on one hand as that dark continent. What is it? Joseph Con uh, Conrad calls it uh, what the heart of darkness. We think about Africa as this, uh, this strange, exotic place, uh, foreign from us, uh, prim uh, uh, not quite well mature, uh, primitive in some respect. And don't think about the fact that, well, the African continent includes places like Israel, includes places like Jordan, includes places like Iraq and Syria and Saudi Arabia. Uh, and because of this, so much of the history that we have, the biblical witness, comes from uh, people and cultures that are part of this. It also, uh, not imagining this as part of Africa, uh, forces us to uh, disassociate the people of Israel, their culture, their God, with the rest of the African continent. The biblical story is a story about a God who comes up from the south, i.e. further down in Africa, coming north to, to live in Jerusalem. Uh, the story in Habakkuk of that trek that Yahweh takes as Yahweh moves north is a trek from further in Africa to uh, the northern portion, the northeastern portion of Africa. We need to recognize that this is true. Uh, and hopefully by doing this, we'll begin to recognize that People on the African continent are not strange, they're not unusual, but they're part of the biblical story, part of our common story, and part of the story that undergirds the development of Western history. If the Bible really is one of the Grundlage of the uh, Western history, uh, then we should recognize an African text has informed and influenced the development of our society today. Mm. So, um in these days, you know, we have the lines drawn differently than, uh, than geographically, of course. We, we know the, the Bible uh, does have Egypt as Africa, um, and uh, 
Kush, Niger, um, Ethiopia. Uh, those are some places that we recognize. Uh, you're saying we should expand our view of that, uh, that the boundaries we have today were not the boundaries that we had uh, back then. Uh, boundaries, boundary lines have changed, obviously, over the centuries. And, and I would say that the boundary lines are often fictive, but we utilize principles. Uh, back in fourth grade geography, we talked about the way that continents come together. And continents come together, when continents come together, there's usually large mountainous ranges, there's, because their continental plates are pressing up against each other, or there are usually great vast uh, seas that separate these regions. We find none of that as we look at the, uh, this northeastern portion of the African continent. There's no mountains that divide Egypt from, uh, from Israel, Palestine. There's no great, uh, that separate that. There are no great um, uh, seas that are separating these pieces. Uh, they're all, in essence, connected, contiguous, or relatively in close proximity. We do see the mountainous ranges that separate the African continent from the Asian continent as you go further to the north. Uh, northern parts of Iran and northern parts of, uh, uh, we see that those mountains there, that's where the continents divide. And we need to begin to recognize that as part of our, uh, if, why do we use a different logic when we look at these lands associated with the Bible? And then we have this strange, interesting concept that we've come up with for landmass that we call the Middle East, and in the Bible, the ancient Near East. And we imagine this sort of devoid from the rest of the world. Uh, the ancient Near East. Well, continentally, where is it? We've got seven continents, and I don't remember any of them being called the ancient Near East or, or the Middle East. The Middle East is a, a reference term uh, based upon pl places in Europe, likely England. Uh, this is the middle of the East between the way to here and the rest of the Orient. Um, it is not a geographical landmass. As part of a geographical landmass, we realize that uh, all of that Arabian Peninsula is the, just the northeastern part of the African continent. All of the land of Israel is just part of that sort of African continental plate. And if we begin to look at that, we begin to look at the, the commonality of flora, uh, similar plants, life that exists throughout this region, of fauna, similar animals that uh, exist throughout this region. And then we'd even look at the similar cultures. Uh, the Semitic languages range not just from this region, but further down into Africa, places like Ethiopia. We've seen these languages persist there as well. Uh, so we see that there's a greater continuity than we might otherwise see. And I think this is necessary because what it does is it reminds us that this is not, and, I, and I'll, I'll use this term uh, uh, carefully, this is not a white story made up by white people uh, and not a European narrative that supports a European cultural construct, this is part of a much larger story of a group of people uh, who have come together from across this African continent and beyond who've made this new story, uh, the story of God's encounter with the world. Uh, let me say it more simply. God did not just come to white people, God came to all people, and God came to all people at this location, this juncture uh, between the regions that we think about as uh, the regions of Eden. Uh, on the northern eastern portion of the African continent. Mm. So yeah, that I'm glad you raised that because that was a question I, I had come to mind as you were just talking. Is that it seems that um, then for 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 white Christians, uh, this might be a new thought and an, and a, maybe a little uncomfortable thought um, uh, because we've thought of it. I mean, you know, Jesus in our baptistry is white with blue eyes, you know, it's like, <laughs> that's, that's who we, we have, uh, our artists have uh, portrayed Jesus. Um, at the same time, you have other people who are, are of color who might say that, well, why would any black person want to be a Christian? That's a white person's religion. Yes. And um, so it, it kind of on, is kind of on both sides. Uh, it kind of addresses this, uh, that as you said, I mean, we were all, uh, the story of Adam and Eve, you know, is birthed in Africa. And then the story of Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and so, uh, yeah, this, this love of God that came to us came in the flesh somewhere. Yes. And, uh, and, and you're, you're, you're suggesting 
Yeah. We call that somewhere part of Northern Africa. <laughs> yeah, I, not only would I suggest that we call that place part of Northern Africa. Uh, uh, I love British forensic anthropologist Richard Neve did a reconstruction based upon uh, the skeletons that were found in the region of what a first century Palestinian Jewish male would look like. And he came up with a uh, five foot one stocky, uh, broad nosed, uh, brown skinned, short curly haired individual as what Jesus likely looked like. Uh, this is a far cry from the traditional Warner Solomon, uh, white, blue eyed, Scandinavian looking Jesus. Now granted, Warner Solomon was Scandinavian himself, hence is why he made his Jesus look like that. We tend to make Jesus look like us. But mm -hmm. if, we, if this is the Jesus who existed, we do ourselves a disservice in a world in which whiteness has become supreme. We do ourselves a disservice by imagining a, dare I say, like us, Christ. A uh, white Christ in a white dominant world makes those who are non-white alien, other, less significant. Uh, less significant to us because they're less significant to God, because God chose to be one of, quote unquote, white Western us. Uh, by having a Jesus that is unlike us, that has a different skin color than the majority skin color in America, uh, having a Jesus that uh, might look a bit more like uh, the Palestinians who are crying out for freedom uh, than he looks like uh, sort of the, the mainstream American individual, by looking more like the brown people that we see locked in uh, in internment camps on our borders, uh, it might change the way that we think about our politics. We are impacting people that look like Jesus quite negatively. It reminds us of that wonderful passage in Matthew chapter 25, uh, the judgment of the nations. Uh, whatever you've done to the least of these, you've done to me. If we imagine that that's what Jesus looked like, it might really change the way that we think about the way we treat those who are other in this world. So I'm all about not only uh, decentering uh, this, this notion of the Middle East as the place, and recentering, uh, recontextualizing Africa in a way, but also saying, let's decenter this quote unquote white Jesus, this Jesus who's been constructed in and for a white Western European context. And let's reimagine Jesus as he probably was uh, a little bit browner, a little bit rounder, a little bit uh, more like the people in this region whom we've been fighting uh, with in a war for the last 20 or so years. Uh, what if that's the Jesus that we should attend to? Uh, mm -hmm. I often do a presentation called The Implications of Our Images of Jesus. And one of the images I pick is um, the uh, Pantocrator image of Jesus, uh, uh, one that was found actually, I think, in, in uh, Northern Egypt. And I utilize that next to a picture of Osama bin Laden. And you'd be surprised at how similar those images look. And I was saying, what if this is the image of Jesus that we had? Might it make us a bit more sensitive in our uh, larger uh, discourse as we wrestle with uh, the Middle Eastern, North African other on a regular basis. So I think that there's great, uh, great profit to be found in beginning to reimagine who this Jesus is we worship, who the people of the Bible are that we, uh, that we have been so invested in, uh, where the Bible comes from. And then as a result of it, what are some of the political social and economic realities that attend to this biblical text? What does it look like for a, a Jewish peasant to stand up against the Roman elite uh, when Jesus is crucified? James Cone does a fine job in talking about the cross and the lynching tree of paralleling lynching in America to what took place with Jesus in the first century and saying that we can understand better what took place with Jesus by understanding and dealing with the racialized lynchings that take place even in the United States of America. So. Mm. So, in America, we've we've um, we've been nurtured in the majority church. I would say, you know, the Protestant and Catholic churches uh, to uh, that are European based, basically, uh, to see Jesus as white. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but we've had in our history um, this idea of the curse of Cain and Ham, and uh, can you can you say something about that? It may be kind of far removed from us today, but the ramifications of that interpretation are still with us today. 
Thank you so much for that question, Rick. I think that that's a question that gets to the heart of the matter. We do see these negative trends of interpreting Cain as, uh, as a black person, the mark of Cain that's put on Cain, and I think it's Genesis chapter four, uh, being a mark of blackness. Uh, the Bible says it's a mark of protection, but the mark of blackness is what's been interpreted. Uh, African American people are descended from Cain and therefore inherently cursed. Mark of protection becomes a curse. Uh, the Genesis 9 passage, perhaps the, one, the most uh, virulent uh, passage in scripture in its interpretive tradition, uh, the passage that says uh, that, uh, that because of Ham seeing his father naked, uh, his father Noah curses him to be a slave to his brothers, i.e. read uh, Europeans, the sons of Japheth, uh, and also read the sons of Shem, Europeans is almost what we imagine it to be. Uh, so this notion of uh, submission by curse brought on by a curse of, of God. We look at that passage in Genesis 9, we don't tend to notice that Ham never gets cursed, Canaan gets cursed. And Canaan gets cursed probably for a very significant reason. We're about to take his land. We need a, a theological justification to take his land later on. This serves as a legitimating ideology in the scripture to do something like that. But we reinterpret that text. You can actually see the way that in uh, the 18, uh, 1819, 1820, 1821, this text becomes uh, reinvigorated. The interpretive tradition becomes reimagined. And we even see places like uh, the, the General Assembly of the State of South Carolina, the General Assembly of the State of Virginia, utilizing Genesis chapter 9 to say this is why slavery in America is legitimate. Now, we say that uh, these things are things of the past. Uh, when I was teaching at Duke years ago, and we would do uh, in, in the Black Church Studies class, and we would have these study groups where we would break out and talk about issues, it was inevitable that every year I taught that, uh, there were at least out of a class of 25 or six people in that class that said, oh yeah, I remember they taught the Curse of Ham in my Sunday school class. Or I remember my grandmother taught me that, my grandfather taught me that. I, I remember hearing about that at, uh, and when I went to a vacation Bible school, I went to a camp somewhere. So even though we say that these are things of the past, they continue to linger in the interpretive tradition. And perhaps what's worse than that, uh, there is an unexamined history uh, because the church that we have today largely came from the church that we had uh, developing in the 1860s and 1870s, uh, the 1820s, the 1830s. The church that we have today is the same church with a lot of the same ideas that uh, permeate the church. So even if we get rid of those major interpretive traditions, uh, the other traditions that, that have led to us, uh, led us to be divided from each other uh, in the aftermath of the Civil War, uh, black and white churches split, uh, often across the street from each other, churches across the South with the exact same name and you can't figure out why one's a great big uh, brick edifice and one's a small little wooden building. Ah, well, maybe they're two Concord Baptist churches because that was the big white church and this is the small black church that was put out of it. Uh, we, we don't look at the history of the way that we do church even today, having been shaped and influenced by it. Another concern is the spirituality of the church. A friend of mine, uh, one of my colleagues at Union Seminary, uh, Bill Sweetser, talks about the spirituality of the church as a, a definitive decision that was made during the Civil War to say that the church could only speak to realms spiritual. They could only talk about personal salvation. They could only deal with uh, morality on that base level and not deal with morality on the collective level. Why? Because we don't want them to talk about slavery. We don't want them to talk about the immorality of this, uh, this system that the South is predicated upon. Uh, so therefore, we relegate your responsibility. As long as you stay in your lane, church, you'll be able to be all right. And we see evidence of that even today in a church that is afraid to critique a larger social system that is racialized, that has patent injustices running throughout it, that continues to exercise uh, its hegemony in negative ways against uh, LGBTQIA people, against uh, people of, of uh, Mexican uh, and uh, South American uh, origins who come over as immigrants, against people of even other faiths. Uh, the church, because it's ceded its ability to talk about things moral, has often uh, been complacent allowed these things to take place. Dr. King notes this significantly in a letter from a Birmingham city jail, when he wrestles with the notion of, I thought that the, the church would be one of my strongest advocates, yet I found it to be one of the chief impediments to the achieving of justice. Or more than just complacent, we also have a church that's complicit. 
Uh, Frederick Douglass talks about this significantly in his appendix to his, um, his uh, 1845 narrative life of Frederick Douglass, when he goes on in great detail to talk about the way that the church participated in, supported, and provided a thin veneer of covering to the racist ideology that supported the slaveocracy in America. So uh, in order for us to truly become the church that we need to be, I might suggest we have to examine our history, examine the way these texts have been interpreted over the years, examine the way that our our, our traditions have come together and find out what the lingering impact is for the way that we do church today. Because the church should be the greatest voice for social change, the greatest voice for racial equality, the greatest voice for oneness in our community today. Thank you for that. That's a, a real challenge to, um, to <clears throat> like you say, to reconsider our history and why we believe what we've always believed. Yes. And that, uh, that that is no reason to continue to believe in what we always believe. We need to re-examine mm -hmm. our beliefs from time to time. Yes, certainly. How do you, uh, how do you transform a, a class, a, uh, a church from going down the path of just spiritualizing everything Yes. to uh, saying this actually has rubber meets the road application to 21st century America? Yes. I love that question because I think it really gets to the heart of where we are as the church today. The over-spiritualized church, the decontextualized church needs to come back and recognize a few things about the biblical text. Uh, so let's go back to, to the prophets. Uh, Amos, uh, uh, Isaiah, Micah, uh, Deutero Amos, uh, talk about the issue of calling, uh, calling for us to move beyond ritual, spiritualized ways of engagement, towards acts of righteousness, that this is what God is seeking in the midst of the world. Uh, we need to attend to that voice. And actually, this is pervasive throughout the prophetic tradition, uh, pervasive throughout the Torah as well, but we don't tend to talk about that as much. But it's pervasive throughout the uh, prophetic tradition. And we need to attend to that. What does it say if we are a church that focuses more on ritual within the four walls of the sanctuary than enacting justice in the larger world, where God says, I hate that. I'm tired of your prayers. I'm tired of your offerings. I'm tired of your, uh, your songs. I'm tired of those things that you do regularly. And that's what we teach in seminary. That's what we do in our churches. That's what we spend all of our time on, but we don't spend the time we need to in the larger issue of social transformation. If you look at Jesus and Jesus's life, Jesus's life is constantly in community. Jesus is in community, not separated from community in a building somewhere. Jesus is in community, asking community to change, asking people to uh, transform the way that they engage. And this Jesus is uh, the Jesus we say that we follow. We need to follow that example and get out into the streets and get out into communities and get out into the public square, get out into the places of power and begin to say, this is what God says. How do we manifest this? One of the things I think is most important for me is if you look at those few lines from the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I think we often think about our goal as Christians to be some great evolved spiritual journey in heaven on a sweet by and by on some wonderful day in the future. Now, granted, I'm a Baptist, a black Baptist preacher. I'm looking forward to heaven like anybody else. But I think there's something about this notion of thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We are as Christians to be manifesting God's kingdom here in the work that we do each and every day. We are to be manifesting God's kingdom here in the way that people relate to each other in the midst of this world. We are to be manifesting God's kingdom here in the way that people are treated in this larger world. This is what our goal is, our job is here. And I think that we need to re realize uh, the importance of uh, a present notion of what God's kingdom looks like. Uh, if they tell you to go out over there to look for the kingdom, if they tell you to go over there, don't go out there after them. Why? Because the kingdom is not something that will come with images of the eye, something to be seen, but the kingdom of God is within you. It's among you. It's, we are to be kingdom bringers right now in this realm. And that does mean working for a more just, egalitarian society in the here and now. 
I'd like to thank Rodney Sadler for the time he gave me to talk with me about all these different issues. There were several takeaways for me. One is the geography lesson, if you will, that leads to a discipleship lesson. Where is Africa and how is Africa related to other su stories and subjects in the Bible? And uh, that was very intriguing and, and interesting. Uh, I remember when I read that article, it was the first I'd heard of that, and maybe this was the first you'd heard of the influence and size of Africa in the Bible and in the world. <laughs> also, uh, a lot about our church history, how we have taken Genesis 9 and other passages to uh, make black people less than white people and how our church has been modeled by an idea that we should not be interested in things that are uh, of this world. We should take care of personal morality and spiritual salvation, and that that is our task, which is contradictory to what actually the Old Testament prophets and Jesus thought. So a lot of things to chew on in this interview. Thank you again for joining this interview, and I hope that if you will, uh, you'll sign up for our e-news so that you can learn about the blog article we come out with each week and also an interview that we have each week. You can sign up, and that is at greatbibleteachers.com. That is the website, and you'll find there a place to sign up for the e-news. Thank you again for joining us.